grain, a tiny grain of sand, landing in the belly, in the belly of the monster. And time is telling only how long it takes, layer after layer, as its beauty unfolds, until its captor it holds in peril. A grain, a tiny grain of sand. In the ocean of estimates, those beneath the sea, open one and you my find. Deep in one of different mind, one who looks like me. Then roam the Santa chamber rang. The victory was the call. Defeat invaders from the north, but they weren't beat at all. Just don't appear. And I refuse to grant you schema recognition that you're here. Now, Now you can say just what you want, but my hurt has ceased. I see signs of myself come, come drifting in from the east. Telling only how long it takes, layer after layer, as our beauty unfolds, until our captor we'll hold in peril a grain, a tiny grain of sand. Welcome to this special discussion presented by the Association for Asian American Studies in collaboration with the Smithsonian Institution, specifically the Asian Pacific American Center, the Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage, and the National Museum of American History. This is organized as a pre-conference program of the 2021 annual conference of AAAS. Thank you for joining us as we discuss the birth of the Asian American movement. My name is is Phil Tejitsu Nash. I teach Asian American Studies at the University of Maryland, and I serve as a board member of the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. And it's my honor to moderate this discussion today. First, a few administrative details. Real live captioning is available during today's live program. To view the simulcast that includes this service, please use the link provided in the comments section. We also invite you to participate in this conversation via the live chat below. Before we welcome our guests, let's take a minute to set the stage. Now, just imagine yourself back in the late 1960s, early 1970s, what Karen Ishizuka and other historians refer to as the long 60s. The Black Power Movement and other movements to liberate women, LGBT people, Native Americans, and Latin American people also resonated with Asian Americans. Asian American studies courses were springing up at San Francisco State, Berkeley, City College of New York, and many more campuses. A major immigration law change in 1965 set the stage for a giant wave of immigration from Asia. 
Opposition to the Vietnam War was galvanizing young Asian Americans who were starting to understand that even if they were American born, they were still viewed as foreign. Arts and culture were a driving force as we strove to define who we were and what we stood for. And please remember, today we're gonna to be focusing on the New York manifestation of this cultural upsurge for Asian Americans in the early 1970s, but some more things were happening in Seattle, Boston, all over the country. What are you doing to gather and preserve this history in your own city and in your own community? Let's dive into New York City's Chinatown. It's 1969. A young student named Danny Young is uh, pursuing graduate studies at Columbia University, and he's leading a project called the Chinatown Study Group, which has been formed to collect data and do socioeconomic research in Chinatown. To hold meetings and to make research material available to the public, he rents a space in the basement of 54 Elizabeth Street. By 1970, a nonprofit named the Basement Workshop has been formed, and the Chinatown Study Group was renamed the Asian American Resource Center. Many local artists, activists, students, organizers, and community members started hanging out at Basement, such as artist Bob Lee, uh, dancer Eleanor Young, activist Rocky Chin, and many, many more. Basement went on to become the hub of the East Coast part of the Asian American movement, connecting and galvanizing the creation of Asian American arts, service, and political empowerment organizations that continue to exist today. One of the key early projects at Basement was called Yellow Pearl, and you've just heard the song Yellow Pearl. That name itself was a refutation of the yellow peril racism that unfortunately continues right up until today. So that's just a high level overview. And I encourage everyone to take Asian American studies courses and interact with the many videos, books, and other resources that describe this history in much, much greater detail. Meanwhile, let's introduce our guests and get some personal insights into this very important time at the birth of the Asian American movement. So we'll start with our first guest, and that is going to be Arlen Huang. Arlen, you're out there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, take it away. Uh, it was great seeing those photos, uh, and listening to Nobuko and Chris Singh brings back uh, the time when, um, well, that time shaped and forever changed my life. Uh, it's hard to believe that it was 51 years ago. Jesus. Um, I would like to thank uh, Sojin Kim. I'd like to thank uh, Phil Nash and the Smithsonian crew for putting this uh, reflection project together. And of course, Liz and Nobuko. Uh, my name is Arlen Huang. And in 1971, Takashi Yanagita and I became the uh, co-coordinators of Yellow Pearl. Lillian Ling was also a part of the Pearl Project, and we have been married for 40, uh, uh, over 40 years. <laughs> the personal is political, man. <laughs> <laughs> and we have two grown sons who are now navigating and carrying on as Asian Americans. Phil? Okay, thank you so much. And uh, let's move on to our next guest. Uh, let's hear from uh, Liz Young. Hi, everybody. Yeah, it, just listening to the music just made my heart throb. Uh, I actually got involved in the Asian American movement because I met Corky Lee in Chinatown. I'd heard about this uh, Righteous Harmonious Fist, Iwar Kun, read about it in the Village Voice. That's how much I knew about Chinatown. And um, said, I'd like to get a job down there. So I went to the organization and I asked, hey, you guys know where I can get a job? And, <laughs> and they kind of brushed me off because we're all volunteers here. So uh, I left and Corky followed me out. And he said, if you're looking for a job, you should go to CPC, Chinatown Planning Council. They, they usually have something open. So I did. And I ended up being the first director of Project REACH in 1971. Um, and, and as for the movement, I wasn't involved in Yellow Pearl Basement Workshop, but it was the energy, the creativity, the, 
the collective searching for who are we? <laughs> Have you figured it out yet, Liz? <laughs> <laughs> Getting closer. Um, it was just overwhelming. And like Arlen, it changed my life too. Yeah. And, and later, I actually got involved teaching Asian American studies at Hunter. And there really was no resources. We had, we had yellow, uh, Asian women from Berkeley and we had uh, roots from UCLA and that was it. So the whole course was a set of oral histories. I would invite Yuri Kochiyama and I would invite Peter Chan from a youth worker in Chinatown. I invited this Fang Ba was his name. He was an old Chinese guy who used to work in the onion fields in California, 1930s. Couldn't speak any English, but we had translators and the whole semester was one oral history after another. And it was such a rich way to know about our history from the people who lived it. And I would suggest to all of my colleagues from Asian American studies, continue with those oral histories because there's a lot more stories to be told and uh, a lot more to do. Um, let's bring in our third guest. How about Nobuko Miyamoto? <laughs> Hi there. How's everybody? It's so good to see you all and uh, be with you and hang out with you like we used to do. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I want to bring Chrissy Jima in the room because he's the one I sang with and who really um, gave me a voice. So, but before I get to him, uh, I want to bring Yuri into the room as well because Yuri Kochiyama was the one I first met when I I'm an L.A. girl, but I was in, in New York uh, at the Young Lords Church, was, which is on the uh, East Harlem. Uh, and the Young Lords uh, were taking over this church, occupying this church, in order to get a Breakfast for Children program there, like the Black Panthers. And I was there uh, with a crew filming because uh, we were doing a documentary about the Black Panthers. And I bump into Yuri Gojiyama, you know, and she starts grilling me. What are you doing here? And I'm thinking, wow, who is this woman with a, you know, she had a, a yellow pencil in her, in her, above her ear and a notebook, you know, and she was asking me, what camp were your folks were in? And, and then she said, are, do you know any Asians here? And I said, no. And so she said, you have to come to the Asian Americans for Action meeting. And uh, so... I just heard a funny story from Arlen about Asian Americans for Action. I'm going to throw the ball back to you, Arlen. Oh, right now? Yeah. <laughs> Catch it, Arlen. Don't drop Catch it, it, man. Don't drop it. <laughs> All right. So this is this is sort of like how I got into um, the Asian Coalition. Um, so um, after after a, a uh, anti-war march at Columbia, uh, the Asian Coalition. Uh, says we're going to have a meeting and uh, everybody go up to room so-and-so we all rush up to this meeting and it's b shaw from la who was attending the agenda and by and by this uh this 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 small lady stands up white hair and uh, she's smoking a cigarette <laughs> and she says i'm doing a silkscreen poster for the next asian coalition march would anyone <laughs> like to volunteer and help <laughs> So I meekly raised my hand and uh, you got to stay with me. This is a story about Chris. And little did I know that, that this gesture would change the course of my life forever. That woman was Min Matsuda. Um, so she invited me over to her house. I go up to her house. And the first thing she does is wrangle me into going to this AAA meeting. I don't know who AAA was. And so AAA is uh, Asian Americans for Action. Get to this meeting, and it's a room filled with these ladies that look like my mom. <laughs> and uh, they're Nisei, and they're, they're so polite. But they were just so radical. I just could not believe how radical they were. And, uh, and, and I saw Chris Ajima in the room, so I sat next to him. Um, after the meeting, I said, hey, Chris, man, what's what's the deal, man? We're the only two young guys here. <laughs> and uh, oh, at, at that meeting, I met the, at that time, Mary Kochiyama, Kazu Jima, uh, at that time, Aiko Abe, and and a few more. And so, uh, yeah, after the meeting, I said, yeah, what's going on, Chris? 
and uh, and he laughed. He says, "I don't know about you, but Kaz is my mother, and she made me come." <laughs> There you go, no go. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Because when I walked into that meeting also, that was what was blew my mind. There were a few more younger people there. But all these Niseis, and I mean, my parents in L.A. would never be at a political meeting. You know, this was unheard of. They were trying to say, don't go to those demonstrations. Don't go to those, you know. But here they were. They were supporting the Panthers and this thing called Ampo Funsai, which was the U.S.-Japan treaty. They were against that. And they were planning a march against, against the Vietnam War. And so that's how I sort of left, you know, all my other priorities behind me. <laughs> and I pick up the leaflets and I start, uh, you know, joining the movement and joining marches. And and Chris Ijima happened to be there. And in the meeting, one of the meetings that I went to, Warren Furutani came in and convinced us we had to go to Chicago because the Asian Americans movement from the uh, West Coast was coming there. And he wanted us to come together. So that was sort of a, an amazing meeting. And actually that's the place where we began writing music <clears throat> because we, we met these incredible organizers from the West Coast, young people who were, you know, uh, anti-drug uh, drug, drug programs, uh, helping elders, all kinds of programs that they were doing in the West Coast, but not so different than what was going on in the East Coast. We were organizing these kind of programs in the East. And then we realized, oh my God, we're a movement. We're not just a little scattered groups doing things. No, we are a movement. And then that, that day we went to see the Panthers and the Panthers had just lost their leader, Fred Hampton and they greeted us like brothers and sisters. Hmm. And then we met Native Americans as well. It, it was mind blowing. Like it, we felt like we were part of this st a new story being made. Yeah. And that night, Chris brought out his guitar. And I'm going like, oh, he plays a guitar. I, I was, I sang, but I, you know, he didn't know I sang. And he just started noodling around. And it was for him a way of relaxing and just trying to, gather the day together and relax. And he started singing a people's beat, a people's beat. And, uh, and I just started singing. He was easy to sing with. And Warren said, hey, you got to sing this song the next day. <laughs> so we were in front of the JECL elders and there's younger people there like us, you know, in our in our long hair and our <laughs> scruffy clothes. And uh, we sing this song. And people were blown away because they had never heard Asian Americans singing their own song. And we didn't really realize that we didn't have a song. We didn't have our own song until that moment when that happened. So that sort of became the core of uh, that song was the beginning of um uh of us writing more songs because we realized how powerful it was yeah. and we did a benefit at the uh, at the a buddhist temple and i'm gonna throw <laughs> and and because we wanted to go to the west coast and see what was going on and we did, we wrote about five songs, and we did uh, some Bob Dylan and <laughs> Beatles songs, and that was the first concert that we did. Yeah. Wow. So, um, and the song that you sang at the beginning, um, that was yeah. one that came soon after that, and you're going to be singing yes. more uh, very shortly. If you're just joining us, this is a, a discussion we're having sponsored by the Association for Asian American Studies and several units in the Smithsonian looking back at the history of Asian America, particularly the Asian American movement in New York. Um, let's jump a little bit ahead. Um, we mentioned Corky Lee, and Corky just passed away recently, unfortunately. He was uh, the, uh, what some call the photographer laureate of Asian America. Um, I know that all of us have very strong feelings about him. We all worked with him in various ways. Um, any of you, uh, Liz, you already mentioned how you got a, a job through Corky. <laughs> any yeah. other recollections? Uh, sure. Uh, in 
1971, I was already working at Project Reach. Corky and I and Marie Lam and Tom Tam and Spencer Wong, we got together for a meeting and we decided to hold a, the first Chinatown health fair. Health, it was a street fair in Chinatown. And we took over Mott Street and Pell Street for 10 days. And uh, the call went out to you know students and young Asian Americans in the, in the tri-state area and 125 volunteers came to you know give t uh, TB blood tests to take take blood pressure whatever you do at a health fair we were doing that and it was just an amazing time to see so many people who were coming because because of the need and the hunger was so great. Well, and it wasn't just health. I remember coming out of that health fair. That's how the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund came together. That's right. People came there and they saw there were legal needs. And so people started forming that. And the same thing was happening all over the country. We saw the growth, uh, growth of service organizations for elders, housing, or you name it. Uh, these groups were all forming. Uh, Arlen, any recollection about that time? Well, you know, this is, um, I can tell you all these stories about the first time I met everybody. Met <laughs> 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 men. And um, so this is sort of how I met Corky 51 years ago. So I'm down at, the, I think it was a meeting for, for, the, for the health fair. And uh, you, you got to picture this, man. I'm from California. I'm in art school. I got long, crazy hair. Uh, you know, my favorite brand is uh, Panama Red, right? <laughs> Acapulco Go. <laughs> and so someone introduces me to this guy named Corky. So Corky's got this cocky uh, kind of Queens accent and uh, he's wearing a tweed jacket <laughs> and uh, he's got like this, this, I guess you call it a mod haircut, right? And he's smoking a pipe <laughs> and he says, Hey, I'm, I'm Corky Lee. You know, sometimes it's hard being Corky Lee. <laughs> He said that 51 years ago. And I said, hey, man, this, this guy's not cool, man. Not at all. <laughs> but then later I saw that he, he, he uh, designed the, uh, the, the health fair button. And I saw him work uh, trying to get everyone together. I said, oh, yeah, this guy's all right. Yeah. Nobody have any memories? Well, you know, it just seemed like Cork, he was everywhere. Uh, especially in that basement, at the basement workshop. Uh, that's where I remember being at these meetings where, <laughs> you know, 30 people crowded into this little basement workshop on 54 Elizabeth Street, right? It was dank, it was dark, it was, you know, and here we were like trying to figure out Yellow Pearl. They, who was it that decided they wanted to use, maybe it was Rocky, decided, that after he heard that concert uh, in the at the church, he said, "Let's make these songs the center of of something. We we wanted to make something with these songs, yeah. right? So um, I don't know if it had the name Yellow Burl at that point, but we sent out a call all over the country for artists, poets, writers to send in their reflections of what they were going through at the time." And it took us a year to collect all this stuff, this material, which was a yellow burl. And it, 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 it turned out in this box uh, that, we, uh, that we put these poems and made these posters and these music sheets so that there was an archive, really, of what we were feeling at that moment. And I remember that, um, I think it was Rocky and Fei Chang knew how to write a grant. Wow, that was crazy. <laughs> and they, they wrote a grant for $3,000. And that's how we got this thing printed. We got this thing printed for $3,000. And I think it sold for about $3 a piece too, right? Yeah. And, a $250. A $250. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it was an amazing way it was more about what we went through in that basement, trying to put this thing together. And uh, the creativity, the struggles that we went through, what was in, what was out, uh, how people were feeling. It made us realize that all over the country, young Asian Americans were just as, 
as crazy as we were and just as mm -hmm. angry and ready to do something and wanting to express themselves that we weren't alone. Yeah. Well, and, and Liz actually took a trip across the whole country. That's and right. Got a, got a very unique perspective. Tell us a little bit about that. Oh, wow. What, what I remember about this trip was when Kenny and I were going across that we didn't get invited in by anybody to have dinner with them or sleep on their lawn. In fact, we heard a lot of racial slurs, especially in middle America. And it wasn't until I, uh, this young woman who was a white, young white woman traveling alone on bicycle, who was going to hunt her, she caught up with us. And she was telling, she was telling these stories about how wonderful people were to her and they let her sleep on the front lawn and they invited her for dinner. And it was like, wow, that's a whole different reception than us. The mm -hmm. only people who invited us for dinner was on at the Indian reservation in North Dakota. Wow. Yeah. And I remember we had, uh, I had to go back to the motel to get something. And one of the, the daughters came with me and the hotel manager, a white woman, she was saying, you, what are you doing here? You know, you're not supposed to be here. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, we're on the reservation. This is their land. What do you mean she can't be here? And it was, it was, um, a startling moment for me. Yeah. Wow. And Arlen, you uh, grew up in Maine and also San Francisco and New York. Any cross uh, city comparisons you can think of? No. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but I would like to. Uh, I would like to backtrack to. Uh, okay. <laughs> to basement and what what Nobuko was talking about that first meeting or the first meeting at basement workshop. Um, I mean, the question was, how did this bare minimum? grassroots organization become the cultural hub of Asian American movement on the East Coast. Because Basement was very small at that time. Um, its, its main purpose was to, to house the, uh, the resource center and to have uh, meetings with Danny and try to plan new things for uh, Chinatown. And one of the persons there was Rocky Chin. So it goes back to after uh, the concert at the Buddhist church, uptown, uh, Riverside Drive, 105th Street. And uh, after the concert, Rocky and Terry Dofu gathered all the people in the audience together and said, oh, we got to have a meeting. <laughs> so he, everyone goes outside. I remember it's a sunny day, so it must have been springtime. And, uh, you know, notices, all kind of announcements. And then Rocky says, uh, you know, we're thinking about doing this songbook. And we want to use the, the uh, words and music of uh, Chris, Nobuko, and Charlie. If you're interested, we're going to have a meeting in Chinatown at this place called the Basement Workshop. Word gets out. And on the day of the meeting, as Nobuko says, the place was jam-packed. <laughs> and I remember looking out and there was people looking in from the doorway. Um, it was like... Uh, families finally finding their tribe yeah. it was a great meeting and just the first time first time i met danny young and danny young was uh, uh he, he's he's one of the most creative persons i know very soft-spoken but a very magnetic personality and he was so gracious and he welcomed everybody uh, little did he know that this invasion of basement was just <laughs> the beginning <laughs> That's how Uptown came downtown because from the Buddhist church, there was uh, Takashi Yanagida, Alan Okada, Larry Hama, and later Tomiya Rai. Mm -hmm. Amazing artists. Yeah. 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 Amazing artists. I mean, it, it's really hard to, I always say, you know, somebody let the genie out of the bottle, but not mm -hmm. one genie popped out but many genies, you know, mm -hmm. geniuses, really, uh, <laughs> yeah. all of you. Um, it was just an amazing creative force. And that force was not, and I feel this way about the music, is that it, it was so much bigger than ourselves. Yeah. And that's what made it powerful. It wasn't just that, you know, ego driven, because 
it was about an idea that was bigger than ourselves. It was about this history that we had been part of, a hundred of years of oppression in America that really was, was boiling inside of us and wanted a way to come out. And, and that's what happened through the music. It was that the music was born in that same way. Yeah, for sure. Go ahead, Liz. Yeah, one of the things that was a side um, development, but really was due to Yellow Pearl and the movement, was the organization of uh, uh, Asian Women United, which is still active. But in the late 70s, uh, Asian women were looking, Asian American women were looking for their, their part of the women's movement because they couldn't relate to what the broader women's movement was dealing doing. So we formed Asian Women United in 1978. And there were some, we did political things, especially with Goldie Chu, who was our, our first president. We, you know, we were supporting uh, uh, workers strikes and uh, attempts to unionize. We were dealing with women's issues. We were a part of a, uh, a our documentary called Ourselves that Noble Co wrote the, the music for and, uh, and sang by Wing, John Wing Lum. And it was an amazing group of women. And in 86, because our lives changed so much, we deactivated as an active organi activist organization, but we're still su a support group and a social network. Uh, and we have been together since that time. And even now we're starting to, we're starting to have these conversations about uh, Asian uh, racism and uh, anti-Asian racism, anti-Black Asian racism. I mean, we're just going there with this because we need to talk about it. And that's something we don't usually do. Yeah, and I think uh, Arlen's also part of uh, Godzilla. You want to talk a little bit about how that group uh, came about and continues to this day? Well, um, in the 90s, I, I started to, uh, we formed a group called Godzilla. It was a, uh, essentially, it was, uh, uh, it was a group that didn't want to bake their own pie, but wanted a piece of the pie <laughs> in, in, in the art world. And it was an art networking group. And uh, we've been disbanded for uh, over 20 years. But recently, some of us have gotten together and uh, uh, we've become active again. And we've been taking stands on, um, on art matters, uh, artists' rights, and especially um, this whole thing that is happening now with institutions, institutional reckoning. Um, so we're, we're alert and we keep and try to keep uh, these institutions uh, accountable, whether it's major institutions like MoMA or even our own community cultural institutions. And uh, that's, that's what we're doing right now. Yeah, it's amazing now that we can also be part of the establishment. I mean, those of us who started as outsiders, I mean, you talk about Takashi Anagita, went on to become a lawyer, Alan Okada worked for big, uh, institution. I mean, everybody, even if they were artists as younger persons, had very diverse careers as well. Um, but the beautiful thing is they all manifested their artistic uh, visions as younger people. And, and like you say, you and others have kept that going for your whole life. So at this point, uh, um, we're going to be turning to one of the preeminent artists of Asian America, uh, certainly somebody who's inspired me for years and somebody who is... Uh, <laughs> Is, is her voice, but also just the way she conducts herself and gets out there and does many, many wonderful things. Uh, if you just Google her name or go to her uh, Great Leap website, you could read more about her career. Uh, Nobuko um, started out uh, doing mainstream art stuff. You can read about her work as a dancer, as a performer, could have had a career just promoting art for art's sake, but uh, instead, like she said, she met Yuri Kochiyama, Kazu, and has done so much to help uh, build uh, the Asian American movement. And as you heard at the beginning, when you heard that song, uh, the Yellow Pearl song, I still get goosebumps when I hear that. I mean, if I'm listening to it on the radio, when I'm driving, I go, oh my gosh, I, I can not only envision times where it's inspired me, but it still inspires me today. 
So Noboko, uh, you're going to be singing something for us. Uh. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, uh, thanks to the Smithsonian, I made another album and reinterpreted some of the songs that uh, came from the movement, but also new songs. But this now, I want to do some uh, reflect back to one of the first songs that we wrote together, Chris and I, 50 years ago. Oh, my God. We are the children of the migrant worker. We are the offspring of the concentration camp. Sons and daughters of the railroad builder who leave their stamp on America. We are the children of the Chinese waiter, born and raised in the laundry rooms. We are the offspring of the Japanese gardener who leave their stamp on America. Sing a song for ourselves. What have we got to lose? Sing a song for ourselves. We've got the right to choose. We've got the right to choose. I knew there was something about me today I, I knew there was something about me today I walk tall and look at all things in a different way yeah, yeah. I knew there was something different about me today. Hey, hey, I look in the mirror and I saw me.
when I see you. And it's like the first time I knew. Who we are. <laughs> wow. Uh, if you're just tuning in, you're listening to a special program on the Roots of the Asian American Experience, sponsored by the Smithsonian, by the Association for Asian American Studies. Uh, I'm speechless. I mean, I, uh, you know, you're not supposed to get emotionally involved in your own programs here, but uh, <laughs> I tell you, uh, anybody who doesn't have goosebumps after hearing that is just not a human being. I mean, uh, thank you, Novoko, for that beautiful version. Uh, Arlen and uh, Liz, is any anything you want to say? Well, let's see. Um, <laughs> I have the uh, the Yellow Pearl introduction, and I would like to read it because it gives it gives everyone, even me, another chance to see what kind of ideas and concerns we had during that time, and uh, and how we really felt. 1972, Yellow Pearl is a collection of the creative talents of young Asian Americans. It is also an expression of an emerging consciousness of being Asian in America. We need to write about the war, Attica, and our people's history. We need to express our loves, our loneliness, and our dreams. Through Yellow Pearl, we share what we feel, what we think, and what we are with our brothers and sisters. Coming together on the project, we have shared 10 months of relating emotionally, politically, and artistically. In the process, we made efforts to re-examine our perspectives and we grew. In trying to project a view of ourselves as Asians in America, we found this best expressed through a clear statement against basic philosophies of exploitation and oppression of individuals as well as nations. For many of us, the hope has been that Yellow Pearl subjective as it is, has become a part of that movement, which is attempting to build a more responsive and responsible society. Well, that's that's pretty wow. dreamy compared to the issues of today. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of us were in our 20s and we were true of heart and we found a voice. Um, you know, the importance of dreaming that's what we weren't afraid to do, and we can't yeah. be afraid to do that now. Right. We have to keep on dreaming. Radical dreams, you know? Dreams that we haven't had before. We lived our dream. We tried to live it. We tried to create it. And now we're passing it on to another generation. And we hope that they're going to have dreams, like we did, um, that are outside the box. That, is, that was yeah. things that we didn't imagine that we that are now being imagined or can be imagined now. Well, look at the Black Lives Matter movement. And Nobuko wrote a song, uh, you know, resonating to that movement. And her song, uh, again, is very affecting and written 50 years after some of these earlier ones. So she is continuing to be an artist. Liz, you were going to say something? Yeah, this the dreaming and doing things that we didn't think were possible. I was the first woman plumber in New York City construction in 1974. And the first day on the job, one of my co-workers, it's my first day on the job, he starts calling me Susie. And I'm going, whoa, this we got to deal with this. And I had to do it in a way where uh, I would have a good working relationship with this man. He wouldn't hurt me intentionally by dropping his side of a 16 inch pipe and that I could do my work because I did, I became a plumber to break into construction so women could have good paying jobs. So I said, okay, I had heard that he was in Vietnam. He's blonde hair, blue eyed guy. So I said, after lunch, can I talk to you after work? And he said, sure. So everyone leaves that way. He doesn't have a, you know, he doesn't have to be a macho guy in front of his, co his colleagues. And I said, I noticed you called me Susie a couple of times today. 
and I know you were in Vietnam. So I, uh, and maybe people, you had interactions with people who looked like me, who were prostitutes, but I want you to be, I want to be very clear. I am not a prostitute. My name is not Susie. My name is Liz, and I'd like you to you call me by Liz. He goes, sure, okay. Never called me Susie again. So I learned to do that because of the movement, because knowing about our history, knowing about the hypersexualization of Asian women, that I was able to come to, to this man and tell, draw some boundaries, say, this is not appropriate. This is what I want you to do. And I want to also say that this is not a, a, a you know, Asian women who were work, do, prostitutes in war was not usually by choice. They were there because they had to survive some way and it was a war time economy. So, and that brings me thinking about what happened in Atlanta recently. And I'm sorry, Nobuka, I cut you off. No, no, this is exactly. Atlanta on our minds, everybody's thinking about Atlanta and <clears throat> how this relates to exactly what you were talking about. How little, how little we're known, how little we're seen still after all these years in this country. Uh, it's a little shocking, really, um, to realize how far or how little far we've gone <laughs> and how much we need to do right now to continue to remind Americans who we are and how diverse we are and how long we've been here. And so our work is not done and young people have a lot, of, a lot before them right now. Uh, maybe this was the shakeup of this year uh, was necessary to, to wake us up again, just like we, Vietnam War was a wake up for us in 1968, in the 60s. So mm. uh, it's, a, it's a moment that we have to use to awaken ourselves, to figure out how do we communicate who we are? <clears throat> How do we fight for what we want? How do we say, I'm not Susie? In such a clear way. I mean, we've all been thinking in our heads, okay, what do I do when somebody comes up to me and, and shouts something? You know, we've all been thinking about things like this. How do I defend myself if it gets violent? <clears throat> uh, these are real things right now that we need to think about. And um, uh, we have to prepare ourselves. And, but we also have to keep dreaming. We have to keep dreaming big. Thank goodness, you know, that there are young uh, filmmakers making <laughs> beautiful and varied uh, characters about people who look like us right now. Uh, we need more of that. We need more songs. We need more visual artists who, to, to show us visions and murals, et cetera, to show a bigger tapestry of where we are and what we are in this land. Um, anyway, that's, and so the, the yellow pearl was just a little seed, you know, it was a little seed that we planted at, in, in 1970, you know, here we've gone 60, 50 years. And, um, you know, there've been many, you know, seeds and many, many projects since that time. Um, but we wanted to remind people where it started, you know, for us and how connected. Also, I want to bring up one other thing, <laughs> that the song, the music um, that we wrote happened after we met Black Panthers, happened when we met Native Americans, that from the very beginning of our movement, we were connected with people of color. There would not have been an Asian American movement had there not been a Black movement. And, and Chris used to say, you know, Malcolm X was the father of our movement. You know, let's claim these things. Let's make it known uh, so that black people don't come to us and say, well, where were you, you know, when we were demonstrating? <laughs> well, we were here. You know, we've been here. Uh, and we are here for you now. Yeah. Well, one of the famous lyrics from your song, you know, we're still here and going strong and getting tired of proving we belong. 
I mean, that, that resonates so much even today. Yes. Arlen, any thoughts on all this? Well, I think um, what a lot of the, uh, of Kristen Nobuko's songs are is changing the narrative. You bring the narrative back to us. It's, it's not about the dominant class. It's not about white supremacy. It's about us and what we do. We name our names. Uh, we celebrate our people in our narrative. Um, I know after Yellow Pearl, um, in, in the following years, uh, the lyrics, we don't want a piece of your pie. We want to <laughs> bake our own, really became mantra. And um, it, it, it continues today. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think we, when I, when I think about it, you know, this time period is very short. Mm -hmm. It was like basically from 1970 to 1973, where this, all this stuff started to happen. Um, so when I think about it, it's, it's kind of mind boggling, you know, um, but you know, when we think about what is, what is Yellow Pro's legacy or what is Godzilla's legacy? And, uh, I think the legacy is to continue to question and to be prepared to bake our own pie again. <laughs> um, and this generation, the next generations, I mean, they're doing a fabulous job. I mean, here in New York, there's a Think Chinatown, there's Yin Kong, uh, Amy Chin, and uh, they continue to, to make, um, make outdoor, outdoor uh, dining booths for restaurants and they paint murals on them. They also do teach-ins on rezoning, uh, public forums on 70 Mulberry Street and uh, the rebuilding of that because there was a devastating fire uh, during this this winter. Um, there's a guy named Patrick Patrick Mock who, during the pandemic, tried to feed as many people as he, as he could. Um, there's there's a group called uh, NUBC in, in New York Chinatown. It stands for uh, Neighbors United Below Canal, and they are fighting the good fight against the. Uh, the uh, uh, four-borough jail uh, plan that is put forth by City Hall. Um, there's there's May Lum of uh, uh, Wing Wing Wo, <laughs> Wing on Wo, and they continue to do art projects. They have an artist in res re residence program, um, and artists continue to 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 do art. Uh, Henry Chang continues to write. Uh, Jeff Lee continues to do music. Alvin Ng continues to, to perform. And it's it's this new generation. Um, now I, I got to tell you, this is great film that just came out. Uh, it's called uh, Snakehead Extraordinary. Mm. And it came out uh, just last week um, at the Santa Barbara Film Festival. Uh, the director, I don't know if, if you, 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 you might remember him from Doing Good Sandy. But Snakehead is a 14-year passion project for him. Hmm. And, uh, okay, truth be told, the cinematographer is my son, Ray Wong. <laughs> 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 yeah, but, you know, that, that's the history. I remember yeah. when, when Ray was in utero, where your wife, Lillian, was marching <laughs> in the picket line at the Silver Palace when we were organizing the first Chinese restaurant worker union back in the early 80s. So, you know, Ray certainly comes from a good pedigree to be an activist. Yeah, <laughs> that stuff seeps. But it seeps in, right? Yes. Yeah. No, and that's what, what this is really about, this yeah. talk is about, is is intergenerational um, passing on, you know, what our, uh, we're storytellers now, we're the, we're, we're the memory keepers now, and we want to tell our stories while we can. Uh, so I speak for Chrissy Jima, you know, we're here for Corky Lee. Uh, we want to be, to be able to tell these, this story so that young people see living, breathing people who are actually part of this crazy moment, you know, mm -hmm. and that we're still crazy yeah. after all these years. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. and I'd like to uh, invite other people into the conversation. We're going to be taking questions. So please go to the question and answer and put your questions in. We'll try to ask them. And also, we're going to try and answer some of them at the various Smithsonian websites. So please send them in, and we'll ask as many as we can. Liz, are you, are you getting ready to say something? Yeah, and, and I'm speaking 
Like me, I'm not a creative person. I'm not a writer, a singer, oh, a ham. <laughs> <laughs> but I am a ham. <laughs> I admit to that. That was the difference between Faye Chang and me. Faye did everything with intention. She knew what she was wanted to do and she did it. I performed for attention. <laughs> and I admit that. But for, for the everyday folks who aren't involved as artists or or writers or singers, you know our history now. If you don't know it, take some courses. But we also need to take these courses, the history down to the, to, to the elementary, middle, and high school level. Because right now it's, it's housed in the university, so Asian Americans, they go to college, they can learn the history. But we have to make it part of American history. Right. And part, and Otherwise, we're always going to be seen as foreigners. And part of what's happened with this anti-Asian violence starts with people not thinking that we are Americans. This perpetual yes. foreigner myth is there. Yeah. Um, is there any other lesson that you three would take if, if you could talk to an elementary school right now? What is the one thing you would to say about your experience over the past 50 years? Something about Asian America or something about yourself? Is there something you could share? Yeah, I I would say we can't. If fifty years ago we didn't know our history either, mm -hmm. we had to find it. Yes. Now we know it, and we want it. You need to. We need to tell you and every all your classmates, so that they see you as American. And we also have to understand that silence equals violence. If we don't say and tell our stories, people can perpetrate violence against us. And that's what happened in the 1880s and 70s. Uh, so, so silence is violence. And also use your social media. Talk about what's going on. Yeah. Tell people what they can do to, to, to help, to support, to donate. Yeah. That's my little piece. Phil, we've got some good questions here. Why don't we uh, answer them? Okay, um, we've got one from Annie Yu. Um, could somebody send me that question? Oh, how do you make time for joy while also being radical dreamers? <laughs> well, I want to answer that one really quickly because Chris said, if the movement isn't fun, then what the hell are we doing it for? It's got to be fun. There's got to be joy. There's got to be life. There's got to be love, right? Right. That's all yeah. part of it. If it isn't fun, if it isn't, uh, be, and I really do feel that's what they use the music for a lot when we did these concerts and these rallies, is that they wanted to bring some life and fun in and engage people. That's what, what it is really about. And it's fun to engage and to be part of something bigger than yourself. And don't forget, it's it's not only engagement; it's marriage too. I mean, uh, a lot of us <laughs> have met met partners through the uh, movement. So, uh, getting involved with the movement improves society and also improves your social life. So, <laughs> absolutely. You know, you know, we we really don't talk about that very much, but I mean, um, the relationships and and all this stuff was happening all during during the movement, all during the meetings, and people got together and people people. We had relationships, got divorced. It's, it's life. <laughs> and children and life. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, where do you find joy or happiness? You find it right in the movement. You find it right in what you do. Yeah. Uh, and that's, yeah, I, that's what it is. I remember um, uh, talking to Chris once and just reflecting on how his mom was just an average mom. She was just, she did the same things every mom did going to PTA and all that stuff, but she also was a profound intellectual mm -hmm. and an organizer. She helped to form the Committee Against Anti-Asian Violence. She, she helped, you know, she was involved with so many different groups and yet she also was just a mom. And someone like Yuri was our internet before there was an internet. You go up to your and she'd have her little flip book and say, what's your name? What's your phone number? Oh, you should be involved with Nobuko. I'll give you Nobuko's number. And, and not would, only that, she would, her ironing, ironing board was, the. you know, you walk into her house and the first thing you saw was the ironing board, right? And then the ironing board was 
was the telephone and the pad where where, <laughs> where she would write everybody's name that called or came into the house and what the conversation was. But she also ironed on that board her, her kids, you know, clothes it and would call them to wake them up in the morning. I mean, I said, wait a minute. You're, you're waking up, uh, you know, these kids when they're already 25 years old and living in their own apartment. Or she says, well, they're very heavy speakers, sleepers, you know. <laughs> she, I'm going like, are you crazy? <laughs> so, yes, it's all part of life, you know. Yeah. You know, yeah. our elders were uh, AAA, Asian Americans for Action. And, and like you said, Novako, food was a big deal. Yes, yes, yes. Right? Food. Yes. And always, you know, did you eat? Oh, we're going to have a potluck. Uh, after yes. the meeting, there's food, right? And uh, that's life. That's living, having a great time. Well, not only that, I remember after meetings, we would go out and hang out in Chinatown. Yeah. Right. And and for dollar twenty five, you can get a good plate, a rice plate, mm -hmm. right? At the, In those days. Those and days. so, yeah. And that's when a lot of... Great conversations that happened, and and we learned about each other, and and you know we knew what we didn't know. We couldn't read the menu. There were the people that could read the menu, and the people that couldn't read the menus. Chuk <laughs> <laughs> Kok, Chuk Sing, and all that stuff. Yeah, right. Yeah, I want to give a shout out to Mary Chin. Yes, Go to Chu and Mary Chin. Mary Chin was born in New York, but raised in in Trinidad, and. Um, She's the mother of Kenny, Kenny Chen and Charlie. And she was an amazing woman. Yeah. Down to earth. Right. No, I, I knew her but, well. And she, oh, yeah. Her, her, um, her family gatherings, you go there, there's a bunch of these Asian Americans who had all their conga drums and, you know, the, the Chin family. Maracas. Maracas. It was a Latino experience. I mean, it was really a wonderful family. And um, They were from Jamaica? Trinidad. Trinidad. And Trinidad. Trinidad. That's right. Yeah. Trinidad. Yeah. Well, I want to bring Grace Lee Boggs into the room yeah. uh, because she was a mentor to me and she was there from the very beginning when we went to Chicago uh, in 1970. She was at that conference as well. And many of the marches that we did in Washington, et cetera. Uh, and she, she, she was in Detroit and, and, a, and a huge force in the movement. Uh, yeah. So um, uh, I would like to bring some old yellow pro people into the room. Okay. Uh, life, life goes on life ends. Um, last year, we lost Fei Chung at Suda. Uh, four years ago, we lost Fei Chang. Mm -hmm. uh, many years ago, we lost Alex Chin. Yes. And then many years ago, we lost Chris Ajima. Yes. And way back when, we lost Richard K. Wong, all from Yellow Pearl. Mm -hmm. So we celebrate them too. Yes. Yeah. And that's a really good place to stop here because um, there are so many people we need to celebrate. Um, this can't stop here. This is just the beginning of a conversation. I know that uh, all of us are available to speak more. All the rest of you have elders in your communities. I hope you're gonna reach out to them and do oral histories of them. Uh, find out what were the artistic things that inspired them as younger people. And in particular, what inspires people to stay active in the movement? How can we sustain ourselves and sustain our, our communities of people so that we all can stay active to build a better world? And I think that's really the question that comes out of this. And hopefully one of the good things that have come out of this reunion here, there's just four of us, but we are part of a group of thousands of people, millions of people who are trying to build a, a, a better world, not only in New York City, Chinatown, but throughout the world. So I'd like to thank everyone here, uh, uh, Liz and Arlen and Noboko. Uh, also, I'd like to thank the audience, everyone who's watching, listening, commenting. I'd like to thank the Association for Asian American Studies, uh, the Smithsonian. And we want to specifically acknowledge um, uh, Asiya Yubi, Tamiya Arai, Jennifer Ho, Leilani Nishimi, Amy Bong, Lisa Sasaki, Manny Monas, Nathan Kawanishi, Jessica Arce, Lissa Huff, Lawrence Mind uh, Bowie Davis, Theo Gonzalez, 
and uh, Sojin Kim. And uh, we're going to go out with another slideshow. Uh, and be sure and catch the opening slideshow if you didn't see that before. And we're going to continue to look back on the early years of the Asian American movement here and uh, the uh, Yellow Pearl Project in particular. And the song you're going to hear is from uh, Nobuko again with Chris and uh, Charlie. It's called Free the Land. So thanks again to everyone Thank for being you, here. Everyone. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>